Los Angeles. In a moment, we go up close with Braves pitcher Tom Glavin. We'll talk about the Cy Young Awards and what to expect from the Braves in 99. But first, we check in with SportsCenter for today's headlines. All right, Gary, a major change in the Big Apple. Knicks GM Ernie Grunfeld. On this edition of Up Close, the National League's reigning Cy Young Award winner. We'll talk with Braves pitcher Tom Glavin about his stellar career, his new book, and trying to get the Braves back to the World Series. Tom Glavin, Up Close. From the ESPN studios in Los Angeles, here's Gary Miller. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the latest edition of Up Close. We're very pleased to welcome in an old buddy of mine, Tom Glavin of the Braves. And Tom, as we look at that picture of the celebrations and you see Lemke in the background, and you see other guys, and you look over the years, is it kind of strange to see every year you guys seem to be in that thing, the turnover and guys that you got very close to that aren't around anymore? Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, you, you look back at, go back as far as 91 and when this thing all, st all started and, and the only two guys that are left are me and Smoltz. Uh, and then you go back to 95, the championship year, and uh, there's not a whole lot of guys left from that team. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a tribute to our organization that we've had turnover. We've gone out and, and uh, made trades, signed free agents, developed players, and, and uh, you know, been able to stay ahead of the curve, so to speak, in terms of not letting your ball club, I guess, get too old or too stale and constantly bringing good young players in. Well, there it is again. You see Freddie McGriff in that. When you see that video, which you see a lot of times in the city of Atlanta, how does the emotion change four years later? I don't think it changes much. I mean, every time I see it, I get goosebumps. Uh, you know, it's just a fun thing to watch. And obviously, uh, you want another one to, to happen so you can experience it again. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, here we are, and that was four long years ago. And it's like, you know, where did the time go in between? So... Uh, you know, it's still a great feeling. I just hope that uh, before we're all said and done, we can do it at least one more time. Well, well ball players, especially fans, but I know the guys in the game must be, you don't often admit it to us, but uh, have to go back and analyze, probably uh, uh, paralysis by analysis mm -hmm. sometimes. When you look back and look back at how close you came, you look at last year, for example, where do you say, gee, if we'd have done this differently, what was missing? Um... You know, it's really hard every year to put a finger on what went wrong. Uh, you know, I think every year, you know, you can put your finger on one or two plays that did or didn't happen. Uh, really, there wasn't a whole lot better about the 95 year that we won uh, compared to the other years that we lost. You're just talking about uh, making some plays in key situations, getting a key base hit when you need to, or uh, somebody making a good play defensively, a pitcher clutching up and making a good pitch in a situation where you need to. Uh, and it's really not a whole lot more than that, but, uh, you know, when you start talking about breaking down short series, you know, you make one mistake a ball game, and, and that really can turn the tide in a series and, and put you behind the eight ball. Well, as a guy who covered a lot of baseball, and this is not uh, a singular opinion, you look at 95 and you say, what's the difference between those other teams that made it to the World Series or came close to making it? And you say, that was the one year where there was a set bullpen that had righty-lefty assignments, that had Wolers at his peak, and in other years, it was kind of a patchwork. You did have Pena in 91. You came as close as you can to winning that World Series. But other years, there's been a different guy every year, including last year. Leitenberg emerged, but really wasn't a, like a Hoffman type. And this year again, Wallers is gone. And now there's some question mark in the bullpen again. I think that's the seam that people would say runs through the not making it. Well, you know, there's no question that, that having, you know, that stellar bullpen uh, put you in a much better situation and, and, and you know you're right in 95 we had Wallers and he was probably the dominant closer in the game uh, had 45 saves that year and, and closed game six of the World Series for us so um, I think what what having a dominant closer does is it settles everybody else in the bullpen down everybody else knows when they're going to be used how they're going to be used uh, and, and let's face it some guys have the talent to be closers but they don't necessarily have the mentality to do it they can't they don't like the pressure uh, they they pitch better in the eighth inning with a one-run lead than they will in the ninth inning with a one-run mm -hmm. lead for whatever reason. I mean, there's some people that are like that. And when you've got that dominant guy that anchors the staff out there, uh, it makes it, like I said, it just settled everybody else down. But, you know, the unfair thing for our bullpen is that they're always going to be the weak link on our ball club. I mean, you're talking about a starting rotation that we have. You're talking about a team that over the years has been pretty darn good offensively. Um, so any time the bullpen blows a save, uh, you know, they're, they're scrutinized up and down for it. And, um, you know, I personally think we've always had a good bullpen because you don't get to the postseason without a good bullpen. Our, our starting pitchers aren't throwing 162 complete games. You know, we're relying on that bullpen. It's just that 
when those guys don't get the job done, they get a whole lot more attention for that than they do when they get the job done. Well, you mentioned Mark Wallace, who's been around. He's a Massachusetts guy, too, so you had another natural tie with him. And you mentioned the mentality of a closer. How difficult was it for guys who were as close as you teammates are to him to watch what happened to him in the last two years? Well, it's, I mean, it's heartbreaking to watch, you know, from the standpoint of, as a pitcher, you sit there and you watch this and you say to yourself, you know, you almost don't want to watch it because you're saying, my God, I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, and it's like watching a guy who's... Uh, you know, got the yips with his partner or his driver. You don't want to watch it because you don't you don't want the same thing to happen to you. And um, and then from a personal standpoint, it's really hard because he's a good guy. Uh, you know, Mark's a good guy. He's a hard worker, well liked on the team. And it's one thing to see a guy struggle because you know, hey, he blew out his arm or he had an injury or whatever the case may be. But you know, here's a guy who was on top of the world, uh, on top of the baseball world, so to speak, in terms of a closer. And all of a sudden, just you know everything disappeared and, it, and it's a you know like I said from both standpoints it's a sad thing to watch and um, you know we would have liked to have seen him work things out obviously and be a member of our ball club and, and get back to the Mark Wollers in 1995 but um, I think everybody probably agrees that what's happened to him is probably the best thing that he's he's in another organization now and gets a change of scenery and and hopefully that'll that'll click something for him. Did he seek out the other guys for advice? I mean I imagine he was turning everywhere and what was your assessment? You know, he did, but, uh, you know, he talked to some guys more than others, obviously. I know him and uh, Greg Maddox were real close, and, uh, and, I'm sure, and I know the two of them talked a lot. Uh, I kind of took the approach that I left him alone. When he wanted to come talk to me, I was more than willing to talk to him about it. Um, you know, he, had, he and I had some similar off-the-field experiences that, uh, you know, he kind of came to me for advice on and asked me how to deal with some things, and, and I was more than happy to help him. But... Uh, I was always fearful of not wanting to push too much because exactly what you talked about, he had a hundred people telling him what he's doing mm -hmm. wrong and what to do. Uh, and sometimes when you're in that case, I know for me, when I struggle, you know, I don't want to have a hundred different opinions. I'm trying to figure some things out on my own. It's nice to have people that want to help you, but sooner or later, you know, you almost get to the point where you alienate everybody because you're sick of hearing things and you're sick of hearing advice and you're so frustrated that you want to try and figure things out yourself. And, and I never wanted to, to push myself on him in that way. Well, he's got a new chance in Cincinnati now, as, as the guys who played with him and know him, they all hope that, uh, despite the fact it's a competing team now, that he can get it together. A lot of evidence that he won't. What do you see as he'll finally say, hey, it's never going to happen for me again? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I would venture to say that, uh, you know, if it doesn't work out with him in Cincinnati, that that would probably be the end of it. Um, you know, I know that... It's a situation where I know our organization tried everything they possibly could with him. Uh, he was very willing to try everything uh, and work at it. And, you know, he, he made such great strides in spring training. I mean, he did mm -hmm. tremendous in spring training. And then all of a sudden he gets back home and gets to Turner Field and, and kind of took two steps backwards. And, you know, you kind of wonder, well, is, it, is part of this problem, you know, Turner Field? Is, this, is part of it that he has to get over a psychological block that he's got to walk onto this field and have, field and have a good game on this field before he can go forward? And, and I don't know if that's part of it or not, but, um, you know, I think that this will probably be it. And, you know, if it doesn't work out here, I don't, I don't see Mark bouncing around to 10 or 12 different teams trying to figure something out. I think that if he can't figure it out with Cincinnati, that'll be the end of it. But um, hopefully that won't be the case. Hopefully, you know, like I say, he'll, he'll figure something out or somebody will help him with something and, and he'll get back to being himself. Well, we've got a lot to get to with Tom Glavin. Things that he mentioned, uh, we'll talk about the old field, Fulton County Stadium. We'll also talk about Andres Galarraga, Henry Aaron's big night. And speaking of uh, the old Braves, we'll talk about a little wildness on Tom's part. One of his old memories, not a pleasant one involving Dale Murphy, up next. 10-10-220, let's...